What up? I'm Ben Freeman from FreemanPD.com, and thanks for joining me over here in the corner one last time this year, because we got one last thing to do. I know we did all the reviews in the 80-day countdown. One last thing to do today, and that is to talk about the FRQs. The FRQs were released this week, so I figured we should go over them. Maybe your teacher went over them in class. I went over them in my class, and um, somewhat positive reviews. So uh, maybe your teacher just said, screw it, and just like is not doing anything right now, and that's totally fine too, I get it. But just in case you wanted, I'm gonna be real brief today, I'm not gonna go into extreme detail, I'm not gonna take two hours and break down this document and that document, just what I would have done, what I see uh, from the outside looking in. Again, I'm not, like, I don't write these questions or anything. So yeah, this is just what I think uh, as someone who's done AP World History before, and so maybe you can mentally still remember, maybe your brain's erased, but hopefully you can still remember what you did and what you said and, uh, you know, and I can hopefully tell you, but I will warn you, warning, they have not released a rubric for this, so, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong, so me, and you may hear Penny wandering around the floor if she doesn't knock all this down right here and ruin everything. So, d just because I say something, does that mean that it's right that you can call up the college board in the middle of the summer and be like, Freeman said in a video this or that? I don't have the official rubric, and any of your teachers or people or... Heimler, Klankler, any of the, the video stuff you watch when they're like, oh, I'm a reader or whatever, we go off of what they hand us, and that's the rubric that we go on. So the big higher-ups at the College Board uh, are the ones that make that list, then the, the readers go in and you go from there. So um, I don't have that in front of me, I'm just winging it, just AP teacher, here's what I think. So let's do a quick autopsy on the 2022 FRQs. <laughs> So let's go in the order that you guys did them, which means we're starting with the SAQs. First up, the Mongols, because of course the Mongols, the College Board loves the Mongols, AP World History loves the Mongols, your teacher was probably obsessed with the Mongols, so here you go, you get an SAQ right away on the Mongols. So you got this dude telling you a couple different things about the Mongols. Number one, they're transformational, and they were the first chapter of a new era. Another thing that he's telling you is that they linked the old empires together, and then finally that they weren't just passively doing things, they didn't just set up a road system and sit back with their feet up, that they were, rather they were actively promoting these exchanges. So right up front, boom, a Unit 2 SAQ. Okay, so on a lot of these, you're gonna get something like this. So the guy makes a statement and you need to give, identify an example of something that supports him. A wants you to identify one economic development that supports his idea of saying that the Mongols integrated the old world. So I think the big one here would be Silk Road. Anything Silk Road trade is a real big thing the Mongols are setting up. So going with that would have been good. I think they specifically mentioned in 2.5 uh, paper and spreading paper technology around. That's used economically in all different kinds of things. So you could have gone with that. And again, it's identified. So you just really needed to name something. Maybe if you said paper, you couldn't just be like, well, paper. You'd have to like, you'd have to like maybe uh, stretch that out a bit, explain it. Explain it a bit more than that, but that's kind of what they're getting at. Anything that would have uh, the Mongols establishing this large empire, this large trade network, any of that stuff that goes along with that that you could fill in uh, from talking about the Mongols in class, that would have been golden. I would have gone with just growth and expansion of the Silk Road. On B, this is something they will do on every single AP exam, at least that I've seen, and that's that they want you to go opposite. They want you, they'll give you something and they want you to critique it. Like, here's a chart. Hey, what's wrong with this chart? Hey, this guy said this. What's something that goes against what he said? And I know that you're a high schooler and they want you to come up with something different than some guy who wrote some book and who's a historian, but still, there are holes in this argument to be made. All right, so on B here, they want you to play contrarian. Explain something that disproves this guy's argument, but specifically how they are the first chapter of a new era. So what disproves the fact that they're the first chapter in a new era? A couple different things you could do here. Uh, about them not being the first chapter in a new era. Uh, the number one thing I would say is pastoral nomads aren't the first chapter, at least not the first chapter of this era. Like, they're kind of the last of that group, at least on a large scale. So just running counter to that, saying specifically how this isn't a new chapter when they're pastoral nomads. Like, that's kind of ancient. And the other thing would be, like, the next chapter is kind of post-Mongol. If anything, you could argue this is the end of a chapter, like the spread of this empire, and then once this empire kind of fades out, that's where you run into Unit 3. That's where you run into Ottoman Safavids, Mughals, and uh, Ming China, and, and Russia. All of the Unit 3 stories start the same with, and the Mongols left, or the Mongols are no longer a problem, or Mongols, whatever. So uh, that's not the first part of a chapter. I'd say that's the end, 
end of a chapter. So if you're making that idea very literally on the chapter line, you could do that. But otherwise, I would have just gone with the fact that the Mongols aren't a new chapter, specifically because they're pastoral nomads. Letter C for the Mongols here. I wouldn't say it's super tough. Uh, it's just tough because I don't have a rubric in front of me. And I know that's like, well, you don't have the cheat sheet in front of you, so that makes it more difficult, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's because I don't really know what they're saying. I mean, look at what it says here. Explain how one intercultural transfer or exchange resulted from the Mongol conquest. Okay, does that mean something that exchanged between cultures or something cultural that exchanged between places? So, I don't know. Uh, I did make a map of this in class. I'll put it up here. You can see it's really any of the stuff that um, benefited from the Mongols' uh, conquest, which I get, you know, the murder, death, and, and cities destroyed and all that stuff is terrible, but then all that stuff that came afterwards, really, if you could explain going from one place to another, one culture to another, religion would be a big one here. Um, but again, look at this map, you can see all kinds of different stuff that I put on all of my stupid maps. The second SAQ. <sighs> I've seen some commentary online, people talking about how they like this one. I think this one is rude. Just straight up rude. Why? Look at the prompt, right up front. Plan of factories, trading posts and warehouses in the city of Canton, or Canton, uh, if you're in Ohio, I guess. But this one is in southern China, so we'll say Canton, uh, in 1856. This plan was drawn from a survey of an area carried out by the British Royal Navy. Great. Uh, the thing I get here is, you've been taking a test for at least an hour 15 at this point, and you're on, on a timer, and you just came off a Mongol essay, and then boom, you're in, and you see factory, and you see buildings with names. I think I would have been really quick to be like, oh, cool, factories, this is Industrial Revolution. Let me see what's going on with the Industrial Revolutions. Hold on. If you didn't get into um, trading post empires and the factories were just like the spot for you to store your stuff that you're trading, you're kind of like a uh, little trading location, kind of like a mini sphere of influence or whatever, then that changes the view of this uh, very drastically to where this is a unit six question and not a unit five question. So um, I think if you didn't get tripped up on that, like it, it's in parentheses, I mean, they're telling you literally like, oh, this is trading posts and warehouses. That's what factories are. But if you just like glance past it, that could have been an issue. Otherwise, I think it's a great question. So here's the map. Don't worry about the gardens or the shops or whatever. It's just the big thing to see on this when you're looking at it is Danish factory, Spanish factory, French factory, American factory, Swedish factory, and that we're in China. Great. And you can see the lines there of the ones controlled by Chinese merchants. So you've got these places and all within the city walls here in Canton. Again, not Canton, that's in Ohio. So you get two identifies right away, basically asking you the same thing. One, an economic development, one, a political development that led to the situation represented on the map. So, situation represented on the map, you got these European places in a Chinese city doing trading stuff, right? So, what's an economic development? What's a political development? And then finally, explain one reason why the survey of Canton factories was carried out by the British Navy. Like, why is the British Navy doing this? Why is the British Navy there? That kind of thing. Which I think is kind of specific for an SAQ like this, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. You should be able, you should be able to get this one. Uh, I do think this is the easiest of all four of them, uh, if you throw out the factories thing. How is it easier? Get this. I think, personally, if you argued it correctly, you could answer A, B, and C with the Opium War. And if you said Opium War, you couldn't just be like, oh, A, Opium War, B, Opium War, C, also Opium War. If you explain how uh, economic developments led to the Opium War, that's an economic development that got you in this situation right here. If you said B, a political development, hmm, wars are political, that's between different states, and how that led to the situation on the map, you could do that too. And then see, why is the British Royal Navy there? Because of the Opium War. So uh, that could work uh, just as easily. Really for A, you could get into really any industrial background. As long as you're leading up to them being in China, you're probably gonna do well there. And B for the political one, if you didn't wanna say like, oh, the Opium War, you could just talk about how the Manchu, Qing, Chinese are just not really doing it well. Anything uh, from that uh, century of humiliation, if you wanted to get into that and like, oh, look at all the bad stuff. I mean, this is uh, relatively early in that. Um, but not super. I mean, again, the Opium War going on, that's what I would have gone with there. And see, that's why the British Royal Navy is there, is because defending their interests after the Opium War. So, again, if you explain that out, the other two were just identified. If you explained it out for C, you're probably good. Then you have the option. So between three and four. Ooh, the decision. What did you choose? I'm hearing a lot of Colombian Exchange and not a lot of Green Revolution. Uh, three was super basic Colombian Exchange stuff. I'll run you through it real quick. Uh, a, identify one technological development that directly contributed to the Columbian Exchange. That's the simplest thing on the entire exam. I didn't see the multiple choice. I'll never see the multiple choice. They're super secret. I tend to double down on 4.1, where it's all that technology, like I'm looking at all the boats and the flouts and all that stuff. I made a whole flout video, all that stuff uh, is there uh, for you to use, and it's an identify. So if you said astrolabe, compass, flout, anything that like will help to create the Colombian exchange as a thing technologically. I assume if I was a reader that I'm gonna be getting a lot of astrolabe stuff and a lot of boat 
technology stuff, late teen sales, maybe you know, stuff like that. I would have gone with any of those, uh, but that's easy. That's that's simple. That's done. B, they want you to identify one benefit of the transfer of crops and or domesticated animals to the populations involved. The big thing here is population increase, specifically in Afro-Eurasia, all those calories coming back over, potatoes, tomatoes, turkeys, whatever. Uh, that's what I would have gone with there, and you just had to identify. So if you said that and then named a couple things, if you said potatoes and tomatoes and population increase, that's a benefit. Uh, you could even, if you went into, if you went into like quinine and, and stuff like that for Columbian exchange, you know, leading to medicines down the line. I mean, you could have done any of that stuff. You're good to go. This is a little tougher because it has to be about the environment. Explain one way in which the transfer of crops and or domesticated animals during the Columbian exchange affected the environment. The one we used in class on this one came from the AMSCO book. It was like overgrazing leading to soil erosion, which is kind of specific. C is definitely the tough one here. That's the one I would have gone with on stuff like that. As long as whatever you said about the Columbian exchange affected the environment. Doesn't say positive, doesn't say negative. You said diversification of crops. You could say, I and mean, you could have gotten into negative stuff environmentally, like how a sugar plantation's not really great for the environment. Uh, if you did anything like that, it had to affect the environment. And then finally for four, uh, if you chose four and you're a Green Revolution person, you're a Norman Borlaug type person and you're wanting to get into GMOs and, um, you know, reinforce stock strength of wheat and stuff like that, that's great. Then this one was really easy for you. If you'd never heard of it, then you definitely went back and did the Columbian Exchange. Uh, if you're watching our review, Glenkler's like, there's always a thing on the Green Revolution. <laughs> it was right here. So, um, yeah, that's it. It's a pretty baseline one. A scientific or technological development, I would have said GMOs. Explain one way in which the Green Revolution benefited the populations in the developing world with more food. It stopped uh, famines from happening, which were predicted to have happened as far back as the 1800s. Um, so that's a benefit. That's one way, you know, they're alive. Uh, Pakistan, India, Mexico, those places were supposed to be hurt really bad and then they weren't. So that's good. Explain one way in which the Green Revolution affected the environment. Uh, anything with like pesticides not being great. That's where I would have gone there. And if you explain that, well, that was what's used to keep the crops from growing and not dying. And then, but the problem is it runs off and affects the water table or something like that. Then you're good to go on that one. So those are the SAQs. Let's talk about the big boy, the DBQ. Spoiler. I like this one. I think it's really good. I think it's very usable. I know you don't care because you'll never see it again, but like as a teacher, this is a quality DBQ that could be thrown around pretty easily. Evaluate the extent to which European imperialism affected economies in Africa and or Asia in the 19th and early 20th centuries. A lot of words. So uh, the prompt is crucial. If you weren't on the prompt, if you weren't specifically saying what they want you to say, you're not going to get a lot here, uh, except maybe analyzing the documents. So when you're looking at the prompt, basically it's imperialism. How does imperialism affect economies in Africa and Asia? So whatever you do here, that's your focus. Imperialism affecting economies. Europeans coming over and taking over stuff. How does that affect the economy? That's all you need to be pulling out of these documents. If you're pulling anything else out of these documents, it's really not necessary. That's the stuff you need to get. And this isn't one where you're going to have to go fishing around because they're all very specifically about the economy and how that's directly affecting stuff. Like, I think this is one of the more doable DBQs they've had lately. Uh, I like the Mexican Revolution last year. I think this one's better. This would be a top, easily a top five DBQ they've ever asked. So, and not like in like, oh, how cool it is, but like how doable it is for you, which is really all that matters. So if you didn't do this last year, annotate like I did here. Uh, next year in AP US history, you gotta mark up your essay. You need to make it so that you're not answering the thing. Cause if you wrote about how mean imperialists were to Africans and Asians, yeah, they were terrible, like genocidal, like the worst. That's not what they're asking. You're not answering the question. The question specifically says, how did imperialism affect economies? How did it affect the economy? Not some guy, not some place, not some population, literally the economy. If you're not doing that, you're not getting the point. All right, so here's a lightning quick document breakdown for you. Document one, there's a Dutch factory manager in Java writing a letter to the Dutch government headquarters in Jakarta. He's complaining that he can't hire people to work since they're all forced to work by the Dutch colonial government's cultivation system. And so they can't really hire people to do stuff because they're all in some forced labor system from the Dutch government. Document two is a chart. This one is highlighting a major economic theme of imperialism where the British are no longer importing a ton of Indian textiles. Instead, the Indians are now importing British textiles in large numbers. You'll see this idea. Uh, pop up again here in a second. Document three, an Indian journalist is pointing out the data from the chart in document two, not specifically, but the same idea and how it's disrupting traditional economic patterns in India, especially with the decline of the textile industry, which is what the chart says. Document four, this is the ruler of Zimbabwe, what we would call Zimbabwe today. Uh, and it's a contract exchanging the uh, precious metals and stuff in Zimbabwe exclusively to Cecil Rhodes in exchange 
for guns and sterling silver. So that's a contract. Document five is a Congolese refugee testifying to the Belgian government about the horrors of the rubber trade in the Belgian Congo. Document six, another Zimbabwe doc. These things are really groupable, like I said a second ago. This one, a few years later, showing the terrible economic impact that the new British colonists are having in Zimbabwe. Finally, document seven, is an anonymous African rebel discussing the terrible conditions they faced under the rule of the German colonists. So you should be able to pull a context and a thesis out of this one pretty easily. For context, you just have to give anything you know about imperialism and where that came from and kind of how that led to the changes in the economies that you're seeing in these documents. For thesis, the very least you could do was just pick any of these documents and take that idea from that document and put it into a thesis statement, just rewording the prompt like this. European imperialism affected economies in Africa and Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries by... And then just throw down a concrete way they did it. They gave you a bunch of them. Just pick one and use it. That's all you got to do. And you couldn't say a lot or by being bad or by being good or socially and politically as well. Doesn't count. You need an argument. You're a teenager. You argue all the time. Make an argument here. Hopefully you made an argument. If you just named a specific way that they are affecting the economies, you're good. That's a thesis. A great thesis and a, and a subpar thesis are both a thesis and they both get a point. And they legit gave you four arguments in the documents. If you didn't know anything, they gave you four legit ones in the documents. Here's what I found. They talk about forced labor in documents one, five, and seven. They talk about taxing indigenous populations in document six. Even if you just said that, you'd be fine. Uh, destroying the local economies and industries. They talk about that in like all of them, documents one, two, three, five, six, seven. Securing economically beneficial deals with the indigenous leaders from the Europeans. That's in one, four, five, six, and seven. And there's more than that. I'm just saying there's, that's just what I found in first glance. I just said here, I was doing this a second ago. So uh, there are a lot of different things you could have pulled out of this one. Uh, I think the documents were all kind of leading you in the right direction to make a thesis, to make an argument. So if you're able to pick up on that stuff, you should have been good on thesis, on context. So I'm not going to go over these documents in any more detail than I just did, but they're sourceable as well. The College Board is pretty decent at giving you enough in the source line to successfully get that point, and I think there's several examples here for that as well. For evidence beyond the documents, there's a pretty big missing thing here. They don't say China at all. So any of that Chinese century of humiliation stuff that came with imperialism, you can go back and take that, tie that to an argument you're making or any argument uh, about how European imperialism affected economies and anything from China you could pull out there that would be in the 19th, so 1800 to early 20th, so like 1920, all the way really to World War One, I, I guess is what they're saying. I mean, they don't say it just as early 20th centuries, but uh, if you're talking about that stuff and anything in China, again, they didn't say anything China, that seems open, pretty open for you to, to kind of fill in. So if you did any of that stuff, opium war, you know, whatever you want there, this is a very heavily opium war thing. Uh, I'm finding in these FRQs. So if you went with that, great. That should have gotten you the point. You had one last thing to do before the longest test that you've ever taken in your entire life was done, and that's the L-E-Q. Another choice, I'm running long. I don't want to keep you forever, so I'll run you through them real quick. You had one on the Americas before Columbus. You had one on the conquest or conflict leading to a religious change. And you had one about free market policies in the late 20th century. I imagine it probably broke down like 60% on uh, the pre-Columbian Americas, 30% on conflict leading to religious change, and like 10% on the free market policies in the late 20th century. If you were like me, we were kind of flying at that point in the year. So uh, that may have not really stuck as well as some of the other stuff. For the Americas one, pick a state and talk about how they consolidated power and expanded scope. This is pretty straightforward. In my class, we went heavy Aztecs, heavy Incas. Aztecs had the tribute system, uh, as well as obviously the rip your heart out situation <laughs> with the uh, religious sacrifice to keep the sun rising. So that's another good thing you could have done for the Incas. It's the roads and the meta system you could have used to back yourself up there. Again, if you're doing context and you make an argument in the thesis and you're supporting it with that evidence that you know, uh, then you're probably doing pretty well on that one if you chose that one. The next one is about conflict leading to religious change. And I initially thought this was super tough, but check the prompt. They don't give you a location. That means anywhere in the world. So I was like, oh, damn, unit three is in the building. Ottomans, Dev Shermay, Safavids, Shiism. But then I was like, wait a minute, it doesn't say where. And if it doesn't say, it gives you the time, but if it doesn't say where, it could be anywhere. So then I immediately jumped to where are most of the Catholics in the world today? They're in Latin America. Why are they in Latin America? the Spanish and Portuguese empires. If you went with that, I mean, technically a part of the encomienda system was that you had to convert the people to Catholicism. That's a conquering, a literal conquest, which is what it says. 
That's a conquest leading to religious change as the primary driver of the, of the religious change. If you went for that one on that one, you should have been good. The last one's on free market economies. I'll flash this slide here that I use in class to cover this stuff, but it's basically the liberalization of the economy using less restrictions, less regulations, less taxes, that kind of stuff. Um, and you just let capitalism, let the economy run on its own, right? You're removing that. It's a laissez-faire thing. I'm assuming there's a lot of Reaganomics or Thatcher or uh, Deng Xiaoping, who I couldn't remember in the AP review, but Deng Xiaoping and the um, was it socialism with Chinese characteristics. If you did any of that stuff on that one, you're probably going to be good there. The big news on this exam is that it's over. You did it. So you're being measured against the rest of the planet on this day, how well you knew this stuff at this time, under this time, in this pressure. It can be a lot. And you'll get your score roughly around July 10th. It tends to be a week or two into July. I don't know how that'll change or whatever, but that's where you should expect it. So two months from now, you'll know. Two months from now, you'll know. All right, that's it. I've been at this thing for a while. Uh, I think you got a pretty decent, at least from the FRQs, it looks like you got a pretty decent uh, AP exam overall. Seems like it's pretty good, like it was doable. There there wasn't a rude, I mean, that factory's line, I'm still a little stuck on that factory's line. But otherwise, I think it's fine. I think it's good. I think that I love the DBQ. A couple of the LEQs I like, if I'd rank them, love the DBQ. LEQs and SAQs were fine. Nothing where I was like, that's mean, that's tough, anything like that. So other than that, factory line seems pretty clean. So have a good summer. Take some time away from school. Oh, and does anyone know how to stop a dog from growing? Penny is like doubling in size every two weeks and I don't know how to stop her. She's massive and she won't stop growing. So if anybody knows, uh, let me know. Pretty soon she will be larger than the house we live in. So have a good summer. I'll see you. Uh, good luck with a push next year.